Hello, everyone. Namaste and shalom. Welcome to this very special conversation with top experts on the topics of anti-Semitism and Hindu Dvesha and what Hindus and Jews can learn from one another. My name is Julie Paris, and I'm the Mid-Atlantic Regional Director of Stand With Us, an international nonpartisan organization that fights anti-Semitism and educates about Israel. A key piece of our work revolves around building and growing our interfaith friendships, including the relationship we have with the World Hindu Council of America and the Hindu community at large. Over the last several years, we have learned from each other, shared our traditions and culture, and found common ground and support on many social and political issues affecting our communities today. Our friendship is based on shared moral values, beliefs, and challenges, which we will hear more about over the course of the next hour. I'm grateful that so many of you, nearly 500 at last count, from across the globe, including registrants from 37 states in the US, from Rhode Island to Hawaii, and from a dozen countries, including Canada, Austria, India, Indonesia, Hungary, Ireland, Malaysia, the UK, New Zealand, South Africa, Trinidad, and Brazil, who have taken time to be with us today to learn together and strengthen our bonds. I'd like to recognize our esteemed panelists, including Dr. Nathan Katz, Distinguished Professor Emeritus of the School of International and Public Affairs at Florida International University and author of Who Are the Jews of India? Dr. A.J. Shaw, who currently serves as the president of the VP VHPA, AJ co-founded the Hindu Students Council and HinduNet. He is the founder and convener of the World Hindu Council of America initiatives, the American Hindus Against Def Defamation and Hindu Pact. He serves on the board of trustees of the Hindu University of America. Dr. J. Bonsal, VP of Education of the World Hindu Council of America and a scientist, author, and global technology advisor of a global petrochemical company. And lastly, my dear friend and colleague, Distinguished Professor Emeritus Peggy Shapiro, Stand With Us National Director of Special Projects and co-founder of the Association of Children of Holocaust Survivors. I would also like to thank Daniel Bedell Cortina, Stand With Us Mid-Atlantic Campus Manager, and Joe Basrawi from the Israeli American Council for helping to organize today's program. The webinar will go as follows. I will ask a series of questions to our panelists. I will then lead a question and answer session based on the questions that have been written into the Q&A button that you can find on your screen. Please be sure to write questions into this Q&A over the course of the conversation. My goal will be to keep us on track and make sure that we cover those questions and concerns that matter most to you, our audience, when speaking about anti-Semitism and Hindu Dvesha. Without further ado, let's get started. Let's begin by exploring how anti-Semitism and Hindu Dvesha manifest themselves. Peggy, there seems to be some confusion about what anti-Semitism is. Can you help us identify what it looks like today? Thank you, Julie, and thank you everyone who's at this call. And, um... I can understand why there's confusion, but let me tell you a little bit about the importance of what we're doing just for me personally. I'm a child of two Holocaust survivors. I was born in a refugee camp in Landsberg, Germany. That's where Hitler wrote my comp, his plan for the genocide of all the Jewish people. I was, I lost everything. Um, my parents lost their childhoods, their homes, their families, between them 182 family members. So I know how lethal hate can be. And when we look at anti-Semitism, it's confusing sometimes because it's irrational. We, it's like a virus. It can start in one form. We think it's been eradicated and then it mutates. Uh, it's not a static disease. It can adapt to new environmental circumstances. It invades neighboring organs, eventually metastasizes. And it's been doing this, adapting and invading civilizations for 2,000 years. Now, one form 
that's an early form, but we still see today in manifestations, is religious. <laughs> the early Christian Jew, uh, church had a Jewish problem because the very presence of a Jewish people in the world continuing to believe in the faithfulness of our God and to our covenant challenged Christian orthodoxy of a new covenant. How could they explain away the Jews? So then the Jews became responsible for the crucifixion of Christ, forgetting that Christ, Jesus Christ was Jewish. And they admit that notion. And they just uh, justified the destruction of the temple by the Romans and the scattering of the Jewish people. Because Jews who were committed deicide, what could be worse than deicide, needed to be punished. And then the next slide, um, in this religious domain, we Jews are described as demons, devils, subhuman, um, and saying that we drank uh, Christian blood or we used Christian blood for uh, making our matzahs when one of the things is strictly forbidden in Judaism isn't to even consume any drop of blood blood that is part of our kosher laws but this religious anti-semitism led to inquisitions expulsions and brutal discrimination against jews in fact in poland when my parents were children easter was the most dangerous day for the jewish community um, so there was an effort in the religious anti-Semitism to convert Jews, and they did. In the early 15th century, about a third of the bishops in Spain were of Jewish descent. But Jews were forced into conversion. Some of them pretended to convert during the Inquisition. But that wasn't enough. If you look at the next side slide, you'll see that there are also uh, accusations uh, the next one of conspiracy theories. Uh, the, the world is in Jewish control. If it were, I think we might be doing a better job of it. Uh, and there is a cabal of Jews engaged in a conspiracy to destroy the world, uh, at least to blame Jews for all the world's problems. I used to run a blog called Conspiranuts. There was a squirrel that was accused uh, of working for the Israeli Mossad, and uh, when there were shark attacks uh, on the Egyptian coastline, they said that th these sharks have been trained to attack only non-Jews. Uh, another form, of man, another manifestation of anti-Semitism is the economic. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Especially during the time between World War I and World War II, when there was a depression, somebody had to be blamed. And just as the Jews have been blamed for the bubonic plague and for COVID and for 9-11, for everything else, well, the Jews were being blamed for the economic downfall. And when you see the images here of Jews running away with money bags, sitting in the control of the world. Jews were blamed for being communists. Jews were being blamed for being capitalists. And it didn't make any difference that it, uh, this should cause some cognitive dissonance. The next slide we see is a different manifestation of uh, anti-Semitism. And that is racial, that one race is superior to another. Uh, my parents, my family suffered because non-Aryans were considered less than human. Jews were portray portrayed as vermin, lesser biological beings, corrupt, greedy, wealthy, controlling. The racial anti-Semitism led to the massacre of six million Jewish men, women, and children, and at least five million other people. And it was a catastrophe so huge, I think it stunned the world for a while and in polite society, people weren't overtly anti-Semitic. And that is until today. We see racial anti-Semitism again, except now surprisingly Jews are labeled as white. Um, and there's violence against Jews on the sidewalks of New York, our most prestigious universities. 
Uh, reality check is that more than 50% of the Jews in Israel do stem from North America and the Middle East. And we come in all colors. I remember my mother when she was ill and really close to her death, saw the three these four women in the squad on a TV program and accusing Jews of being white oppressors. And she was stunned. She said, I lost my whole family because we weren't Jews. We weren't white, excuse me. And now I'm being accused of being white. It's very difficult to understand. But it doesn't end with just economy and nationalism and racism. We'll go on to the next slide where it shows Jews are being attacked, not as the individual, although we see that also, but for having a homeland. Now, we know that in the past, Jews were demonized because we didn't have a homeland, and now we're demonized because we do. And a lot of that comes from the former Soviet Union propaganda. They were very annoyed when Israel uh, showed how uh, superior American arms were to Soviet arms in the 1967 war. Their tanks laid in the desert, uh, destroyed, and they launched a, a campaign unlike any other against Israel with false links between Zionism and Nazism and fascism and racism and genocide and settler colonialism and imperialism and militarism and even apartheid. And this, these ideas eventually led to the Zionism is, is a form of racism in the UN in 1975. So people say, well, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm anti-Zionist. Well, that equals, I don't promote the murder of the individual Jews, but I'm fine with the elimination of more, uh, the, of more than 7 million Jews in Israel and any other Jews in the world that feel a connection to Israel, which is of course the great majority of Jews. Anti-Zionism is a prejudice against the Jewish movement of self-determination. And the next slide. And to accomplish this, they have to deny Jewish history. Holocaust, they say, was, is, uh, didn't happen, or it's Holocaust denial or inversion, with political uh, cartoons equating Israel with the Nazis. Uh, Professor Butts at Northwestern University wrote The Hoax of the Holocaust, and it's now in its 25th printing. There are hundreds of books, including a thesis by Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, that said the Holocaust didn't happen. It was exaggerated. But if it did happen, it was perpetrated by Jews, and Jews are inflicting it on others. They call Jews colonial occupiers. We've been in the land continuously for over 3,000 years, longer than the French were in France, the British in the UK, and certainly Americans in the US. In fact, you can't stick a shovel in the ground in Israel without coming up with something of Jewish heritage. The word Israel occurs in our Bible 2,507 times. And no matter where we are in the world, we pray facing the Jerusalem. And yet we see an effort to destroy us, our right to believe what we believe, uh, to challenge our right to exist as individuals, to challenge our right and to sovereignty. So JG, do you see any parallels to the experience of Jews, uh, to the experience that Hindus have? Absolutely, Peggy. As, uh, as one of these slides I'm going to show in a second. Uh, there is there are parallels after parallels. It's, you know, it uh, looks like they're operating from the same playbook uh, on Hindus as, as they are operating in Jews. So uh, for the benefit of my Jewish friends, let me just begin by noting that uh, Hindus and Jews share many common values. And uh, I'm sure uh, my friend Nathan will talk about some of those in his part. Uh, but they also share share very similar histories of subjugation, genocide, and ethnocide. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Next slide. So very brief review of our history of last 1,200 years or so. Very few people uh, out, you know, outside of India are aware, uh, maybe aware that we have suffered two bouts of brutal colonization. First one started in the early 8th century uh, Islamic colonization, and it went on, gained strength as time went on. And it, uh, oh, and then in uh, 1700s, 
British took over and they colonized us for 190 years until they were asked to leave in 1947. So uh, these are outsiders. They typically come in small numbers and they have to survive in a large population. So how do they survive? There are two tools available to them, brute force, genocide. And then brute force doesn't last very long and it, it actually invites violent reaction from the, uh, from the uh, suppressed. So they also have to uh, actually colonize your mind, erase your identity. So you are confused, you don't know who you are and hate yourself. Next slide, please. It is probably uh, an open secret that Hindu genocide is the biggest in human history. I quote some uh, British, uh, some uh, Western scholars here, uh, because a lot of people don't uh, uh, think uh, Indian scholars are unbiased. So here we have Will Durant, uh, American historian, saying the Mohammedan conquest of India was probably the bloodiest story in history. And then we have Conrad Elst, a Belgian scholar, saying the Indian subcontinent population decreased by 80 million between year 1000 and 1525. In fact, genocide kept on going much after that as well. Then we have the British period, 190 years. During those 190 years, they managed to manufacture 31 major famines. Never happened before, never happened after. 60 million people died. 100 million people were left prone to diabetes because of something called thrifty genotype syndrome. Next slide, please. And then I said, you know, you, uh, you have to create confusion in uh, people's mind, erase their identity. And that happened in spades with us as well. Indologist is a breed that was created in uh, uh, late 18th century and uh, gained ground in 19th century. They came across our uh, ancient texts and ancient language called Sanskrit. They loved it initially for its beauty and for its uh, perfection. But then they said, well, these blackies, these pagans, could not have, could not have invented it, could not have developed it. So therefore, it must have been brought out, brought into India to them by the uh, enlightened Europeans. So they invented this European Aryan uh, concept. So they, so our race was considered mixed of uh, mixture of European Aryans with the tribals, and our language and our scriptures were brought in by the Aryans. And they were the interpreters, the Indologists were the interpreters of these and telling us what our faith meant. And since uh, foreigners were coming in all the time, we had no exclusive claim to our ancestral lands. Our civilizational uh, knowledge, science, arts, math, uh, philosophies were appropriated without attribution. In fact, some attribution was given to Greeks and Arabs because they were a little bit closer culturally. Missionaries descended upon us like locusts. Portuguese Inquisition on the West Coast of India is one of the bloodiest. They invented new ways to torture the natives. Um, the uh, Anglican Church from um, Britain, they started coming in the late early uh, 19th century and they found our society was impervious to conversion because of the social structure. So they decided to destroy our social structure by importing the caste system, which is a European concept on us. And they demonized our intellectuals, the Brahmins are, uh, the heinous uh, criminals and so on and so forth, and castigation of our traditions. And I'll speak to that in a second. Our education was, their own reports were talking about educate, how Indian education was widespread and how great it was compared to British education, except that in 1835, English education was imposed on us and that overnight created an elite, elite class and a backward class. Marxists came along in the mid 19th century and they looked at the world looked at us like they looked at the rest of the world through the duality of exploiter versus exploited. If you don't look like exploited, you must be the exploiter, therefore you must be destroyed. And replaced with what? They did not know. Next slide, please. So that's all part of history, but where are we today? Where we today find ourselves is that we are in a 360 degree attack on our ecosystem. Academia, entertainment industry, uh, news media, social media, and many, many organized syndicates all get together, you know, uh, build the message, amplify the message, spread the message at the speed of light. 
And unfortunately, we, what we find is Hindus at large are ignorant and apathetic. They don't know what's happened to them. They don't know what's happened to them, partly because you know we're financially and uh, professionally doing well, and we think that's uh, that's that going to protect us. Next slide, please. So now, just very briefly, uh, what does this word Hindu Dvesh mean? A more popular term is Hindu phobia, but unfortunately, it is a lazy adaptation and an inaccurate adaptation of Islamophobia. Uh, phobia means fear. And quite frankly, no one is and should be afraid of Hindus. We don't have a 9-11 in our history. We don't have Boston Bomber in our history. We do not have Charlie Hebdo or any of that. So why should anyone be fear, afraid of us? The term that we have invented is Hindu Dvesha. Dvesha is a Sanskrit term, means hate, aversion, and disdain. And it really is a better descriptor for the experience that we have today. Next slide, please. So I'll, I'll skip that. <clears throat> Next one, please. So uh, a lot of red paint and uh, ketchup has been wasted on creating these scenes, but these have been created so as to paint us with a violent, bloodthirsty culture, uh, you know, for the benefit of the Western world. Next one. Uh, we are being uh, positioned as a patriarchal a hierarchical and a filthy society. Uh, look at the smash Brahminical patriarchy. Uh, Furkan Khan, uh, she was a journalist. She said, if Indians give up Hinduism, they will also be solving most of their problems. What with all the piss drinking and dung worship. This fellow at the bottom says, time for Brahmin Holocaust. And someone yells and says, hell yeah. So here we go. Next one, please. We talk about devil worship. Look at this uh, piece on the left of your screen. Uh, this was used in a uh, political campaign against a Hindu uh, candidate. Positioned us as Satan worship, the devil worship, devil worshippers. The uh, one on the right is a CNN uh, documentary that found some some little fringe group somewhere practicing either cannibalism or some something like that. I'm not even aware of what that is, but it was positioned as mainstream Hindu dharma, Hinduism. Let's go. Next one, please. Uh, you talked about uh, Judaism versus uh, Zionism. The, the same playbook is being used with us. Uh, Hindutva, is, Hindutva is exactly same as Hindu, uh, Hinduism, uh, except it's, uh, it, it's a set essence of being Hindu, but they are positioning it as something evil. They want to dismantle uh, Hindutva, but they don't. They don't mind uh, Hindus. They don't want to touch Hindus. It's just they want to destroy Hindutva. Our biggest festival, Diwali, is being positioned by this uh, particular uh, um, outfit as festival of fact, where Christmas is being positioned by the same publication as having delicacies that India loves. Next one, please. Caste, as I said, is a European term that was practiced for hundreds of years in Portugal and Spain, and then in the New World, uh, with devastating effect. It was imposed on us by the by the will of the British uh, colonizers, and now it's being weaponized against us in the Western world, saying we are castiers, we are uh, oppressors, and therefore uh, we must be taken to task. Next one, please. Our organizations are being positioned as practitioners, practitioners of Nazism and fascism. This is from a, uh, a Tinek is in my state, uh, New Jersey, and they passed a resolution calling my organization and many others as Indian right-wing nationalist paramilitary organization whose ideology is part of Nazism and European fascism. Next one, please. Uh, this requires more uh, conversation. Um, uh, swastika actually is a sacred Hindu sem uh, symbol, which has been conflated with the Nazi uh, Haken Cruz. Uh, a lot of my Jewish friends probably don't know the difference, but I think it requires more uh, discussion. And perhaps we can take it up in the QA session. Next one, please. There are many, many attacks taking place on our places of worship. I just uh, uh, noticed four here, but they're there was one last weekend on the West Coast and many more uh, happening all the time in the land of the free. Next one, please. Yes, street level violence. 
this woman um, is he she's a Mexican of Mexican uh, background and she is telling these Hindu women to go back where they came from. Uh, and there are many, many examples like that happening uh, on campuses on uh, in, in various places around the world. Next one, please. Okay, so this is my last slide. And uh, here is a fellow named Sheldon Pollock. He, is, he holds two PhDs, a scholar of Sanskrit, a uh, professor at Columbia University. This is what he's telling the world. Holocaust is a Sanskrit, a Sanskrit sport. Europe cannot be blamed for excessive of colonialism or Nazism because they were building on the socio-political poisons inherent in Sanskrit language. Go figure. And they, he is uh, telling the Western intellectuals that they have responsibility to destroy the built-in social poisons in Sanskrit. Thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you so much to Peggy and Jay for those very clear manifestations of, Hin of uh, Hindu Dvesha and anti-Semitism. Now that we've learned about the manifestations, let's take a step back and learn how this all started. How did we get here today? My next question is for Dr. Katz. We know that anti-Semitism is called the oldest hate and that anti-Hindu anti messaging has been around for a very long time. Where did these societal hates originate? Sorry, you're on you're on mute, Dr. Katz. Yes, I was. <laughs> so um, it's very intriguing now. My, my assignment was to talk about the role of academic world and universities in fostering both anti-Semitism and Hindu Vesha. Um, you saw what's been going on very lately. The president of three major, major universities cannot say that calling for the genocide of the Jews is against university policy. So a university, any cultural institution that's sort of neutral on whether we should kill all the Jews or not, that's where we've come. Uh, personally, and the world's changed for me in a very negative way in the past few months. Uh, very personally, I no longer feel nearly so at home in this country in which I was born. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the rise of anti-Semitism and how that fed into universities. And of course, uh, a major player in the first part of this is Christianity. And then I will talk about Hindu Vesha and its injection into the university and its promulgation by universities. And of course, there we have to go uh, to talk about Islam as well as Christianity. And we talk about anti-Semitism. We have to talk about both as well. We got to learn about each other. That's the most important thing. You're our friends. We're your friends. We all know that. Um, we got to learn some language like uh, Hindu Dvesha is a much better word than Hindu phobia. I agree with that. Another one I would recommend, don't call it an idol for heaven's sake. You know what that means in our culture. It's murti. We can learn, I think most of us in the West can learn a two syllable word called murti. Um, and um, how should I say it? Don't lump us Jews in with a group called Abrahamic religions, please. I know India's history with Muslims and with Christians, and they they're in that that group called Abrahamic. But don't include us when you talk about Abrahamic religions. I got to call you out. In a lot of the uh, very important figures in the Hindu Renaissance, if you read what they said about Jews, it's abominable. Uh, only a few, Savarkar and uh, Tagore, understood us a little bit. But a lot of your uh, leaders haven't. And you got to go back and, and expunge that from your, from your discourse. All right. So... In the first century, when Jesus was born, there was a very 
contentious time in, in, in uh, what we call the Second Temple period in Israel. There were different groups of Jews who were in opposition to one another, and they were arguing about which way to go. That's fine. One of them had this guy they wanted to follow called Jesus. Okay. It wasn't so bad until a couple hundred years later when Christian theology started to develop really separate from Jewish theology. Uh, and Christian theology had to justify itself. Uh, Peggy talked about this a little bit. I'll just mention briefly, but why should there be Christianity in the first place? And the only reason there should be Christianity is because Judaism is somehow deficient, right? So when Christianity comes, it's the new covenant, so our old covenant goes away. Well, well, we haven't gone away. And our presence is a kind of uh, embarrassment to the Christian world. It's a kind of internal threat to the internal world, to the, uh, uh, to the Christian world. And they responded to that perceived threat with very sophisticated uh, intellectual methods. They burned our books. They, burned, they tore the skin off our rabbis. Uh, they murdered us. They tortured us. Peggy told you some of it. If you want to know what it's really like, what it was like, I recommend you look at the biblical book called Lamentations. Lamentations. Read that because we go over what is up in our history. Uh, you'll see why we have an attitude today. Then as things got a little nicer uh, and the church took charge, they wanted to talk to Jews. Nowadays, we talk about a dialogue. You know, where we want to understand the other. And I'm, I love, I'm all for dialogue. We used to talk about debates. I was a debater in, in high school and college. And you try to prove the other guy wrong. In medieval Christianity, they called it disputation. That the very existence of Judaism is a dispute for Christians. It's not debate. Well, it's certainly not dialogue. It's not even debate. So there we go. I'll pick that up. So Peggy covered it very well. Uh, it's got to do with church doctrine that we'll, we both can't be right. So we uh, we can't split the difference with these Jews. So we got to wipe them out. Let me go to India for a minute. Islam came, it's a very different introduction. Islam came into an advanced civilization at the time. It, uh, they started coming, if you believe, uh, the masjids in South India as early as the seventh century during the lifetime of the prophet. It may be a few hundred years later. I'm not a historian. But you have this whole conquest metaphor. And if you read, and, and this really took root with the Mughal period, uh, the South Indian Muslims usually got along a little bit better with their Hindu and other neighbors, but not the, not the Mughals so much. Uh, and if you read the uh, Nama, the bio biography of Babur, the first of the Mughal, he talks at length with great pride about how he destroyed the Ram Temple in Ayodhya to make it present and built the Babri Masjid right on top of it. Um, that's very, uh, uh, let me tell my American friends, right now they've just rebuilt that Ram Temple after people tore down that Masjid. Uh, and everyone I'm in India, he talks about, see, we're doing this. Uh, you should do that with your temple too. Because <laughs> the whole, the, the, there's something about this invading force that wants to destroy indigenous houses of worship and build on their site their own uh, houses of worship. Uh, we also talk about uh, how nice the Sufis were, the mystics, and some people write that even Sufism was born in India uh, when, when, when Islam came in contact with Hindu mysticism. Uh, probably not. Uh, we also know of the great emperor Akbar, who was something of a Sufi himself, we are told, and how he would have discussions at his palace with Catholics and Hindus and Muslims and Jews and everybody else. They come and discuss religious issues, and that was his form of entertainment, which to me is very, very charming indeed. Um, but at the same time, uh, uh, the Vatican's ambassador to the court of the Mughals, uh, Nicolo, Nicolo Manucci was his name, he, he repeated the stories from the Babur Nama about destroying Hindu temples and building, church, and building masjids on top of it. And Manucci said, 
that's wonderful. The Muslims are starting the work that we're going to complete. We got to destroy this too and take it over. Then you get the imposition on top of this of the of Christianity as a colonialist enterprise. And it was mentioned the establishment of the Inquisition in Go in 1560. Uh, and, uh, and from these records, the Western world began to read in a very negative way about Indian culture. And I'm amazed in this uh, wonderful, wonderful book by our friends Bagshi and Nathuri, uh, they got some sites. I tell you, when I was learning, two names uh, of Western Indologists, high above the others, were Friedrich Max Müller and Sir Monier Williams. Now, Max Müller, obvious German Indologist, he, he learned Sanskrit, he translated Vedas and all this, and he, he was so respected, most Indian cities have a Max Müller Bawan or center, cultural center, for him. But Max Bueller, if you get inside him, he thinks that all of this stuff in the Vedas is even more primitive than the paganism of Europe. Uh, and it is a, a quote, Max Mueller, it was a more degraded and savage character than the worship of Jupiter, Apollo, or Minerva. And he says by translating these Vedas, which will be seen as obvious nonsense to any intelligent person, uh, then the mere air of free thought, he wrote, and civilized uh, life will extinguish it. Of course, they went after the Brahmins, especially because they were the custodians of Sanskrit culture to undermine the Brahmins' position because they knew that it was the, it was this heart of culture, just like our rabbis are the heart of our culture. And it's because they study and they learn, they teach, and, and, and they're exemplars to us. It, it's very similar with Brahmins in India. They embody, they carry the culture. Similar. Monier Williams, I have it on my shelf up here, the Sanskrit English Dictionary, the first one of its kind, the best ever done. And he wrote, quote, and so I admired Monier Williams. He said, when the walls of the mighty fortress of Brahmanism are encircled, undermined, and finally stormed by the soldiers of the cross, the victory of Christianity must be signal and complete. So these people, as, as a young scholar, graduate student, these are the greatest scholars. I'm finding out that they have a very nefarious agenda. Now, let me make things a lot worse and come back to the president of Harvard University who can't say that it's wrong to slaughter Jews. We get the um, introduction of secularism into all social institutions, including universities, of course. And the two biggest figures in the intellectual history of secularism are Freud and Marx. Sorry, they're both Jews. I, I, don't, I can't help that. And Freud's work, no, no psychologist or psychiatrist reads it, but people who study religion read it. And they applied Freud's categories to religions. And uh, that especially prominent uh, method of interpretation at the esteemed University of Chicago. And there have been books written about how Ganesh's trunk is, a, is, a, is an impotent penis and nonsense like this. Uh, scholars actually write, they're talking about your God like that. I want to throw in right away before I get to Marx. The Marxists and the Freudians hate all religion, not just yours, not just mine. They hate traditional Christianity, all of it. And they will they will uh, attack it at, 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 every, at every opportunity. Uh, Marx, too, saw religion, as, as, as uh, Jay mentioned, as oppressor and oppressed and so forth. And... And to follow, pick up Peggy's last point, somehow in this equation of a pressure, oppressor and oppressed, we, who have been pretty oppressed much of our lives, have been converted into the oppressor. We, who, as you said, were never accepted as white, are now accused of being right. Is that some terrible thing? Uh, so we're to blame for everything to the extent that in our greatest centers of learning, supposedly, um, you can cry out to kill all of us and the university will protect you. Uh, we got to learn from each other how to deal with these problems. Uh, we need you, my brothers and sisters. I think maybe you need us too uh, because all the right thinking people in the world have to stand up against us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kat. My next question is for AJ. 
The need to prove Christianity, the true religion, seems no longer relevant, yet the old hatred seemed to be thriving and growing. We know that the slurs and attacks on Hindus and Jews are mutating and metastasizing. These are the weapons in the war of words. Who is firing them? In other words, who is promoting anti-Semitism and Hindu devesha? So shalom and namaste. Uh, I'm actually sitting in Kerala today um, and uh, it is the, uh, if, if there is any evidence of the, the long-standing historic bonds between Hindus and Jews, it is where it is in Kerala, where uh, one of the oldest Jewish communities actually, uh, you know, you can find one of the oldest Jewish community. It says that it's, it dates back, Duck Katz is here, so he can actually expand on that. But some people have said it dates back to the time of King Solomon. And the, nothing but harmonious living through the centuries uh, in Kerala. And so I, I just wanted to kind of put that in context. Um, mm -hmm. I, I am currently at a place in Kerala where it's an ashram. And I, there are a lot of Jewish uh, people in this ashram here. And they follow Judaism. And they're, uh, they're visiting the ashram. And uh, they're learning aspects of Hindu dharma. And that is the bond that we have between Hindus and Jews uh, that in, in current time and present time. So now if you can uh, please go to the slides, uh, Julie, uh, I can talk about the slides, uh, talk a little bit about that. Do we have the slides ready to go? Thank you. Thank you. Is the next slide, please? And the next. Uh... Uh, yeah, I think my slides uh, start a little uh, following some of these slides. So we can just go down and more. And next one. Here we go. So this is the, uh, the previous one, please. Uh, previous one. And one more previous one. Previous one. The first slide with the red on it. Or yeah, uh, this one, right? Oh, yes. Uh, this, is a, this is the uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is the uh, it cannot. It, I'm, I'm, I I appreciate who uh, you know the slides. I know it's not easy to do a uh, do the slide rolls in a in a live webinar. So thank you for doing this. It's it's a tough job. So I appreciate. Uh, uh, you know, this thing with the uh, you know with the slides and kind of rolling them as we talk. Uh, this on the left hand side um, is a meme that was originally used uh, against the Jews, the Happy Merchant meme, and now that meme has been repurposed. It's called uh, you know it, it, uh, it it's now being used against Hindus, and this is uh, from uh, social media for last year year and a half. This has become a very popular meme. It's called Paji, and uh, this is the reason. This has been exposed in the research that has been done at the Rutgers University. So you can see that people who uh, this is a, this is a meme that actually shows that a same kind of imagery is being used to target Hindus and Jews if, in the social media. And I'm saying they, and later on I'll tell you who they are. Please go to the next slide. This is, they uh, encourage Hindu hate. And this is an example from the UK school. And I'm going to read a couple of quotes from the parents and the students in the schools in UK. Uh, the parents have said that they have harassed and told, the students have been harassed and told if they convert to Islam, their life will become so much easier. That is, the bullying is stopped. And again, this is a 2023 study by the Henry Jackson Society. Uh, another quote, you aren't going to survive very, uh, very long. If you want to go to paradise, you'll have to come to Islam. Hindus are the herbivores at the bottom of the food chain, and we will eat you up. Or Jesus will send your gods to hell. So a lot of bullying from other people about different gods and even shaming my children about the caste system. If you please go to the next slide. 
They want to dismantle Hindu dharma, and uh, Dr. Bansal mentioned this a little bit. And now they use a proxy for Hindus, just as much as they use Zionism to attack Judaism. They use the word Hindutva to attack Hindu dharma. Hindutva means essence of Hindu dharma. And they, they, these are the, they had a conference a couple of years ago, and these are the exact quotes. And some people just kind of uh, veered off the script and started attacking uh, the actual Hindu dharma directly during this conference. So some of the quotes uh, from this conference, why not uh, dismantle Hinduism and not just Hindutva? Nobody in this pan on this panel has denied that in the dismantle dismantling global Hindutva panel, not this panel, has denied that Hinduism is deeply implicated in Hindutva. I think Hindutva is a political Hinduism, not distortion of some inherently benign religion, but a historical expression of it, which, mm -hmm. con which continues in the works of Dayan and Saraswati, Vivekananda, Aurobindo, and Savarkar. These are revered Hindu, uh, you know, Hindu, some of them are Hindu saints, some of them are Hindu leaders. And there is no Hindutva without Hinduism. And as scholars of Hindu tradition, we are seeing how Hinduism and Hindutva are deeply intertwined. The message they're conveying is, don't just dismantle Hindutva, dismantle Hindu Dharma. Next slide, please. They, they, then they attack the Hindu core, Hindu family practices. So for example, if you're doing Hindu dances and the Sanskrit chants, then you are called a castes. Now, castes being another proxy to attack Hindu dharma. They say that if you say namaskar or namaste, which essentially means that I bow to the divinity within you, you are a casteist. If you are vegetarian, you should feel guilty because you are a casteist. These are actual quotes from a pro, uh, uh, you know, uh, pro anti-caste uh, bill, so-called anti-caste bill in California. Go to the next slide, please. They attack the Hindu accomplishments. Now, I found it very interesting when uh, Peggy and Nathan both uh, talked about uh, the, uh, you know, being uh, Jews being considered white. The, the phrase that has been used for Indian Hindus is white adjacent because they have some of uh, somewhat of a privileged position according to the people who are attacking Hindus uh, uh, in terms of their economic achievements in America or academic achievements in America. So they are considered white adjacent. And the, one of the accusations they made, again, in direct, direct quote, that when I, I, if, if you're winning in math competition, you are somehow a casteist. And thereby, Hindus who are uh, only upper caste and do well in math, and so they are casteist, and they, uh, they are doing it at the cost of people who otherwise would do much better if they were not in the competition. And surprisingly, one of the uh, professors at Harvard, or maybe not surprisingly, unsurprisingly, wrote a book, The Cast of Merit, uh, Engineering Education in India. And she had, she postulated that the achievements of Hindus in the field of engineering is a result of uh, not, uh, it's a result of meritocracy that has resulted due to casteism. To go to the next slide, please. So then who are they? And let's let's find out who they are. You go to the next slide. They are the people who hate Hindu dharma. Here is an example. Here is a quote from uh, Sharman Hussain, who was the founder, one of the co-founders of Equality Lab. And I just one of them. I just read one of the quotes. That absolutely, the Brahmins have appropriated their gods from Dalits and Adivasis. Brahmins have stolen Buddha the hand of Fatima and other Islamic relics. Hinduism cannot be part of progressive discourse until we dis dismantle Brahminism. Now, this is not the first time in, in last probably 10, 15, 20 years, multiple people have said that Hindu gods are not Hindu. They have been appropriated from other cultures. Hindu scriptures are not Hindu. They've been appropriated from people who existed in India before Hindu Dharma came. Absolutely no evidence of this. Absolutely no evidence of this. 
and yet the myth continues to be perpetrated. Next, uh, and, and no less by so-called scholars. Next slide, please. They are the promoters of Gazwa Ehen. Gazwa Ehen, for those who don't know, has been used by the rulers and leaders throughout history to justify the Islamic military campaigns in India. And recently, a Palestinian, radical Palestinian preacher uh, called Hindus filthy cow worshippers and urged Pakistanis to fight Hindus on the border. Continuation of Gazwa Ehin. Next slide, please. Uh, next one. They are in academia, and I will read this quote, and I'm sure uh, in the current context of what happened with the congressional hearings, with the university presidents, you will be able to relate to this. This, uh, the quote, this is a direct uh, quote from the left website of ethnic studies at UCSD. It says, we understand that caste supremacy is sidelined as caste privileged people continue to circulate simply as people of color. Attending to the complexities of race, caste, and religion, we intend to recruit Dalit and Muslim faculty and students in the coming years. We will also work with Dalit faculty members and allies across the campus to have caste included in anti-discrimination policy. And what is the end result? Here is a faculty that they hired who is Indian, Hindu by name, and the, she wrote a book apologizing for a Hindu heritage because she came under attack for being daughter of one of the Indian intelligence agents who was posted in Kashmir. So in, her, in the preface of her book, she wrote how apologetic she is that she was born in the family that she was born in. Next slide, please. The next slide. Thank you. They are the mainstream media. The Inside UK survey uh, that just came out three days ago says uh, cows, curry, and caste. That is how British media perceives Indians and Hindus revealed in a and Hindus revealed the survey. So this is this is how the current Hindu phobia, Hindu dvesha, gets perpetrated. Next slide, please. They are CNN. They are, and so it's very mainstream. Even in the U.S., South Asians say caste is proved has proved hard to escape. Absolutely no evidence on this, but they continue to perpetrate that. And they are the deniers under fire from Hindu nationalist groups. U.S.-based scholars of South Asia worry about academic freedom. Washington Post. Next slide, please. They are those who want to save the Hindu souls. And they go by attacking the Hindu, uh, Hindu gods. And, that is a, and they think that by attacking Hindu gods and driving Hindus away from Hindu dharma, they will be able to save their souls. And finally, who are they? It is not an individual, it's an entire ecosystem. So if you go to the next slide, please. They do not work in isolation. There's a whole ecosystem, which includes uh, a whole bunch of funding organizations like Open Society Foundation, the Omidyar Network, the Pakistani establishment, all of them are in the Khalistani groups, all of them are connected. And this is a report from this, the, this info lab. They've done extensive research on it. If you go to the last slide that I have, which is the next slide, you can see that their network is large and convoluted. And I will, uh, if there are questions, I'll be glad to answer. Again, from this info lab, uh, the funding agencies, uh, multiple funding agencies that represent the uh, leftist side of the Indian politics, the Pakistani intelligence, uh, the uh, uh, and and academicians, the media, and the fundamentalists who want to convert Hindus. They all converge in their goal to promote Hindu Dvesha. And I'll stop there. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, now we've had a chance to hear about the manifestations, the background, um, where are these attacks are coming from. Our final question before we open up for just a few minutes of Q&A is, is relating to where do we go from here? 
As we've learned, Hindu and Jews both face powerful, well-financed, and adaptive propaganda campaigns. Now that we've seen so many overlapping commonalities, what can our two communities learn from one another? Peggy, I'm going to start with you. You're on mute. You're on mute, Peggy. If we look at the next slide, I, just briefly. Um, go ahead. Next one. Don't wait. Act soon. Uh, I'd like to spare you some of the things that we've gone through, and I'm sure you feel the same. Uh, when your enemies come out with statements that they want to destroy you, believe them. Uh, don't dismiss it as pure rhetoric. Save your students, save your young people, train your student leaders. Before kids go to school, give them their reason, have them understand their own identity so that they can feel proud of it and uh, mm -hmm. not feel that they have to check it in at the door when they enter university. This is the hardest one. It's been hard for Jewish communities. Unify. You may not have the same opinion with all the other groups, but unify where you can. Uh, because if not, there'll be groups that try to uh, get us to isolate, to be divisive. So unify. And what we're doing right now, form alliances. Uh, we, can, we don't have to face this alone. It's a problem, it's very sad, but we don't have to face it alone. And we can have an entire other session on so many ways in the last few years that the Jewish and Hindu communities in the US have been very supportive of each other. A lot of it doesn't make the news, but it's extremely important. You, we didn't spend much time, but define your terms. Don't let people who hate you define who you are. And for that, we have the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. It has now been uh, adopted by over 1,100 organizations and entities because we are Jews who experience anti-Semitism are going to define what anti-Semitism is and not leave it up to somebody else. So those are my quick recommendations. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Jay, would you like to add anything? Sure, yeah. Just, so the, I put three uh, three points there, and uh, I would be very surprised if uh, they're also not common between uh, Hindus and Jews. I think there, you know, there there is an ecosystem of enemies that develops within within the community. You know, they they look like you, they talk like you, they believe like they seem to believe like you, and yet they're acting against our interests. We have, for example, a organization called Hindus for Human Rights. Hindus for Human Rights, is they're neither Hindus nor for human rights, and yet they're pretending to be, and they're confusing our children. So, so we need to be aware of these systems building within our uh, structure so that we can be aware and prevent them. The other thing is, you know, just because we are economically, some of us doing economically and professionally well, is not, is not going to protect you against these issues. So, you know, even those who are doing extremely well economically, they need to educate themselves on what is happening to our civilization narrative and be part of that conversation and contribute uh, to, to, you know, to contribute. it. And the last bit I had on this uh, slide was, you know, we have a lot of uh, high net worth uh, donors who are blindly contributing to the academia that is actually working against the, you know, the community's interests. They need to be educated by us as to what, they, what they're doing is actually against their interests and our interests. Uh, so, so I think we need, to, we need to target these people. We need to identify these people and start educating them so that they are, uh, you know, at least they're aware of, you know, um, uh, what is happening before they make their decisions for uh, supporting various institutions. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I actually heard a quote today from a famous rabbi. I was attending a vigil for the 136 plus hostages that are currently still being held in Gaza. And uh, this rabbi said that one act is better than a thousand shrugs. So that, you know, to me, anything that we do is going to contribute towards the positive future for both of our communities. Now, we are um, just running very short on time. There are so many 
questions and all of them are so, so important. I'm gonna pose just two. And what we're gonna do then is in our follow-up, we're gonna be answering those questions that you have so um, thoughtfully um, asked today of our panelists and they will be responding um, in addition to our sharing of additional information in our follow-up. So um, regarding just two, two pieces, on the one hand, we have people thinking that there is no longer the, the kind of anti-Semitism from Christian communities. So how do we address um, Islamic anti-Semitism? But on the same, on the other side of the coin, we have people asking questions specifically about Quran and anti-vaxxers and, and uh, merging together anti-Semitism into those movements. So um, this is sort of a question about anti-Semitism coming from two different perspectives. So Peggy, this is, I think, for you. So what... <sighs> To sum it up, whatever society at that moment considers the worst thing, whether it's the Black Plague or COVID or 9-11 or killing Christ, whatever at that moment is considered the very worst, that is then attributed to Jews. So that's why you say, well, why are the Christians, the ancient, you know, the old Christians have gone, the earlier, but those images once they're created, those messages, once they're created, live in cultures and are transmitted. So it's, I, I think we should learn to identify as much as possible, share our knowledge, but it's not that one group is good and one group is bad. The anti-Semitic images, the anti-Semitic messages live on long after the people who have created them died. And then they're passed on and somewhat changed. Obviously, no one's blaming us for the Black Plague, but they are blaming us for the vaccine and for not having the vaccine and for having the vaccine and for having COVID and for not. What it doesn't matter what your point of view is. If there's something bad and you don't want to accept your own responsibility for it, the message is blame the Jews. So we need to get uh, to most people who don't want to be anti-Semitic, we need to get that understanding out so they can recognize it. Thank you. And our, our last question has to do um, really with, with some of the bias that was addressed today. Um, this bias can be found in schools, um, both in K-12, um, uh, specifically discussing ethnic studies um, through some of the uh, academic, uh, of course, environment that we're seeing on college campuses and also in the media um, in our in in our political framework. So, do you have any suggestions? And this question is open to the panel of ways that we as communities can address um, these biases today. I do. Um, somebody mentioned about donors. I think it was uh, VJ. That's very important. Uh, it's more important than you think it is. Uh, when the Oslo Accords were being signed, there was a provision that the Palestinian schools should teach uh, not hatred but peace and so on. Uh, I said, if that if that's common, it'll be good. But of course, it never, ever happened. Um, so we have to be very, uh, very wary. I was able to establish a chair in Jane Studies at my university, and I'm working, even though I'm retired, I'm helping to establish a chair in Tamil Studies at my university. And you need to have a, a senior member of the faculty at any school you're thinking of making a donation to, to be your champion. Uh, because the university wants money with no strings. Donors want to give money for a certain purpose. If the donor is firm, most universities will accept your terms. Uh, with the Jane community here in South Florida, well, as a national community, uh, I got them to say that if any time you are not satisfied with what the university is doing, we'll refund your entire gift. So negotiate the terms well. Last thing, you may not know about it, but in 2007 and 2008, first in Delhi and then in Jerusalem, uh, the chief rabbinate of Israel sent a delegation and the Hindu Dharma Acharya Sabha, a Hindu uh, teachers group, met and the first thing they concluded, and they issued a public statement, very important, we Hindus and Jews worship the same God, who, for his own reasons, completed, uh, created us to follow different paths that all lead to him. So 
none of this idolatry nonsense. Uh, and I remember I'm talking with some of my people I know in the area who are very conservative Christians and think Hindus are idolaters. And when I tell them that the Israeli rabbis said they're not idolaters, they're saying, oh, they, they know what they're talking about. So we, we just got to learn about each other and uh, we got to be very smart with our money. Uh, both Jews and, and, and Jews have largely been very dumb with their money. Uh, Jains are a little smarter. Hindus should be smart, too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I really want to just take a moment to thank our wonderful panelists for being with us and sharing your expertise today. I know I personally learned so much and, and really look forward to continuing to lean into these relationships um, and to building, continuing to build our friendships and our coalitions with all of those groups that are really struggling today. Um, and, and as Peggy mentioned, the Jews are sort of the canary in the coal mine. We are whatever society deems the worst quality. And, you know, we are sorry to be in a situation where you as Hindus are facing the same similar hatred. And we are grateful for your friendship. Um, and wherever we're seeing this hate, we should fight it and stand up for it, whether it's on the left or the right, whether it's in our hometowns um, or wherever we see it, you know, just stand up and, and teach your children to be proud of who they are. Um, so, you know, thank you again. You will be, everyone on this call, everyone who registered will be receiving a follow-up email. It will include additional information. It will include videos. And also hopefully it will include answers to the many, many questions that we have in the Q and A right now. So I apologize that we couldn't get to all of your questions. Um, if you'd like to learn more or get involved in our work, just reply to the email and someone will be in touch with you. And thank you again. And I look forward to this being just a glimmer of hope um, into what I know will be a very bright relationship for all of us moving forward. So have a wonderful evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.